Folks, welcome inside the Parisi Palace, high above 3773 East Broadway. This is a live edition of the Jake Feinberg Show, comedy on Power Talk. Thank you so much for making us part of your day today. It's been a big day of work, um, but it feels good to uh, close it out with a seminal character in the history of modern recorded music. Um, He was really not on my radar until Dean Parks mentioned him as a a forefather of recording in the studios, um, especially during the advent of what would be termed uh, rock and roll, uh, which originally was known as rhythm and blues. And um, he, uh, my guest, is somebody who has had a decorated studio career Uh, playing on all types of different albums with all types of different artists, always trying to serve the song, which is very much reminiscent of his generation's ability um, to craft beautiful uh, music, no matter what uh, the genre is. And um, I feel very humbled to be able to talk to him because um, uh, Ben Benet and uh, Tommy Tedesco and uh, so many other amazing uh, players are no longer with us and so um, my whole goal of my show uh, is to leapfrog as far back as possible in the lineage of music to discover enlighten and inspire people to be themselves and create new music vocabulary and I got a chance today to speak to somebody who was right in it and is still in it Louis Shelton welcome to the Jake Feinberg show well nice to be here it's great to talk to you, man. You know, I just, I wanted to, um, did you ever work with Bruce Botnick? I sure did. You want to talk? Yeah. I just interviewed him two hours ago, and, and, I, and I'm just reading through your discography, and I'm like, those two must have crossed paths. I mean, did you, can you talk about him as an engineer and what was special about him? Um, well, not, not particularly. I just remember uh, uh, an album that I did with him, um, and probably more than one, uh, but uh, I I don't think I can. Yeah, so he wasn't. He wasn't. You, yeah, way, he way back. You know, that's that's fifty years ago, and uh, it wasn't. Uh, he wasn't someone at the time that I knew as well as say a Bill Schnee, who, who you know, uh, or some of the engineers that I worked with almost on a daily basis, but. I remember that the album I did that he engineered and possibly produced was an unusual character, and it was an unusual kind of orchestration and, and all of that. So I remember the album, but, you know, uh, the amount of time that I actually spent with, with Bruce in the studio, he was in the control room and I was sitting out in the guitar chair and stuff. It wasn't much of a, a personal relationship. Oh, no, time. what was the, what was the, do you remember the name, so who was the leader of the album? Well, I can't, I can't remember the artist's name because it was the only thing that, that he ever did. Interesting, and, interesting. Uh, I'll have to look that up. One of those, one of those albums that, uh, it wasn't a big hit album, you know, like, like a, you know, a Jackson 5 or something that I can easily remember. It was a, a very, unknown artist but a very peculiar artist so i'm gonna do some i'm gonna do some digging on that Uh, you know i I, I, I could look his name up on the internet i I could look that album up but uh but not at this moment i couldn't don't worry about it it's fine you know what i really wanted to i mean did you did you know ronnie hawkins oh God, I know that name so well. No, well. because I mean, you have to excuse me because I just saw that you were born in Arkansas. I wasn't sure when you moved. You found to... out from the band. Exactly. Yeah, Ronnie Hawkins, Hawkins and the Haw. Exactly. And I, mean, I wasn't sure when you actually moved to the West Coast, but 
I mean that that was those those road houses down in Ar- Arkansas were were, were legendary. Well, I, yeah, yeah, I played in those, but you know, uh, now you're not talking about Lee Von Helm, are you? L- no, no. So Ron, Ron exactly. No, Ronnie found Lee Von, but no, Ronnie was the was the head cat. Was he in the band? Well, he was the, he was the. The, the band was the called the Hawks before they were the band. So he was their leader uh, before they left and became the band. Because uh, when I first got to L.A., the first gig I got was traveling with, with Joe and Eddie. And uh, at that time, that was in the uh, early, early mid-60s. And, and we played in Toronto and Levon Helm and the band were playing at a club there before anybody knew them. <laughs> and, we, and we used to go there after our gig and watch those guys play. Uh, so I didn't know Levon and, and most of the band, but I, uh, I, yeah, it must have been after the Hawks and just before the band, possibly. I mean, can you talk about, as best you can, the regional sound of... Arkansas. I've interviewed Freddie Tackett. So many crazy. Um, every the thing that made this country so special, the United States, at one time was that before full interconnection, uh, every every region had its own sound. Uh, you know, there was a different sound between Chicago and Detroit. Uh, there was different. Uh, different feel between Miami and you know like Atlanta uh, it, it was and I just wanted you to talk a little bit about um, you know I've interviewed Clyde Stubblefield the, you know the drummer from Rest in Peace from James Brown and you know a lot of those rhythms came from a lot of organic sounds outside the the, the trains uh, the chugging of the trains the, the 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 way things moved it was very um, it was very auditory, and it was also mm-hmm. very it was also very natural. And I just wanted you the best you can. There's no right answer. What do you believe the regional sound of uh, Arkansas was? Well, it, uh, from the beginning, most most of it was country music. You know, Arkansas kind of being a very uh, rural area, right in there with Alabama and surrounded by uh, Tennessee and. Uh, all of those, you know, Louisiana. So uh, all of those states contributed to the music that was going on, uh, which included uh, mainly country and blues. And, uh, you know, so many of the great blues artists came out of that part of the pocket of the United States. Uh, But uh, having said that, uh, with radio and my family that loved listening to music, I was exposed to uh, all of the music that was going on, such as uh, Artie Shaw and Benny Goodman, uh, Les Paul and Mary Ford when they came out in the 50s. Um, and then uh, when rock and roll came out, uh, since Elvis was, was just from Memphis, he would. He came to to my high school when I was thirteen, and uh, before when his when his first record was out, uh, "That's All Right, Mama," and I got to meet Elvis at that time. And of course, uh, by that time, then rock and roll burst open, and and of course we had all of the the top forty that that and and, and then we had the the Dick Clark show on TV, and so it it became a potpourri of all kinds of music um, and other musician friends of mine uh, exposed me to, to some of the jazz guitar players like Barney Kessel and Johnny Smith and Wes Montgomery and I went and dug their records out of the music store and started listening to that stuff because there wasn't a lot of jazz being played around Arkansas uh, so I had to delve into the record stores to get my fill of, of the jazz stuff. But otherwise, um, you know, in those days we had black radio also, and my family uh, used to listen to that, you know, because we had the great artists like the Platters and, and all of them, and, 
Oh my gosh, there's just so much around Arkansas and those southern states. And so much of the stuff came from those areas, you know, and ended up out in L.A. and New York. It's true. No, I mean, it's, you know, can you talk about seeing Elvis? I mean, I find him to be one of the most compelling figures because, I mean, I've done enough interviews to know that, um, you know, he was singing rhythm and blues, but there was a payola scandal in the early 60s and and a lot of the r&b which you know a lot of people would say it's kind of modern day what would be modern day hip-hop today in terms of the lyrics being very raunchy and uh and racy and then they they cleaned it up so then all of a sudden you had you know uh pat boone singing like uh hank ballard in the midnighters tunes or whatever you know it was was like a little bit phony and then and then elvis came along and and they said well we sure can't call it rhythm and blues that's that's black music so we'll just call it rock i mean do do, i know you probably weren't like that tapped into that but can you just talk about that milieu of of rhythm and blues and and maybe more to the point you know as an instrumentalist, how you went about incorporating colors and, and little phrases into music like that, because you were really on the cutting edge of that music. Well, yeah, I was there at the, the very beginning. Now, when, when Elvis came to our high school, that was before he even had a drummer, and I had never uh, seen him before. The only thing I'd heard from him was, was my sister, who worked at a record store, brought one of his his first record song, uh, which was, uh, I believe, Blue Moon of Kentucky and and, uh, That's All Right Mama. So when I saw him perform in my school, it was just uh, himself with uh, Scott D. Moore on guitar and Bill Black on bass. Sure. And up until that point, whenever you saw a, 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 a performer up there with a guitar around his neck, he just stood there. Uh, and saying, and there was none of his jumping around and stuff. <laughs> so his live performance was the thing that separated him from anything that any of us had ever seen. And I, yeah, some of the old, older generation found that disgusting, you know. <laughs> but uh, <laughs> that was really his his his. Uh, his trick, you know, that was his live performance. Uh, plus, plus, he sang those songs really good, too. Um, but being a guitar player, um, as his records would come out, and, you know, he had Chet Atkins playing on it, and Scotty Moore, and later Reggie Young played guitar on his records. Uh, in those days, my ear always went to the guitar stuff, and, what, and that's why if someone like Chuck Berry came out, you know, I couldn't learn the stuff fast enough. Uh, I was just a real uh, enthusiastic guitar nerd. Um, so, but we got all of the uh, great uh, rock and roll performers in our area in Little Rock. I mean, uh, we had this drive-in movie that was just a few blocks from my house, and and on top of the concession stand, we would get people like Jerry Lee Lewis and Carl Perkins. Wow, and these wow. early rockers that would come there and we could just see them for free because they were all from such close, you know, close by Little Rock there. You know, most of them were from Memphis and some of those places. So we got to see it all. And then we had a beautiful auditorium there in Little Rock, the Robinson Auditorium. And um, that was the second place, the second time I saw Elvis and probably the third time. Uh, he played at the big auditorium, and because that was a place where I played on this uh, show called the Barnyard Frolics every Saturday night, right, which was right. kind of like uh, the, the Grand Ole Opry on a smaller scale. Uh, since I knew uh, the people backstage, I could get in, so I got I got to go back and hang out with Elvis, and uh, he was such such a uh, friendly person. Uh, you know, he. He would walk around with his guitar around his neck, singing funny tunes, and anybody that came up to him, he'd shake their hand and say, oh, how are you doing, man? Yeah, yeah. 
just a, a real a real friendly guy. Um, oh, that's so cool, oh my God. And the interesting story about me and Elvis is uh, after I uh, had gotten into the, the, you know, after all, he'd gone out and made all these big movies and all of that, and then I go out to L.A. and become a session player, I get a call one day to go, uh, go down to the studio uh, for something with Elvis. I thought it was a record date. And what it was is they had me and uh, uh, Earl Palmer and some of the other uh, top session players of, of that time. They called us in there and said, Elvis wants to start performing again, and he's going to go to Vegas, and he would like you guys to go with him. And um, at the time, uh, and Elvis was there, and he was in perfect health. I mean, he looked fantastic. Uh, of course, none of us wanted to leave L.A. because we, well, for me, I had just really tapped into the session thing. I had done, yeah. Uh, yeah, no, the Clarksville and the Jackson 5, and, uh, and the thing about L.A. is if, if, if you got to be there if you want to be a session player. You can't be going out on the road and stuff because you get replaced right away. <laughs> I, I learned that early. Yeah. <laughs> so I didn't, I didn't go to Las Vegas, and uh, of course James Burton ended up doing it, and he was the perfect guy for it. And at all, when my wife came to the door and said, I just heard that Elvis passed away on the radio, you know, from, from the news, and I couldn't believe it, because last time I'd seen him, you know, he was a, a perfect specimen of health. So he really he really deteriorated when he, when he went back on the touring again? Yeah. Yeah, uh, and and he was pretty much stuck in in Vegas. That, that oh, I mean, I don't know how much touring he actually did. I know most of it was in Vegas because that way people could come to see him instead of him having to travel and you know and do that thing. But uh, apparently, um, whatever it was, uh, the pressure of that show and and, and terrible eating habits and and probably got on more medication than anyone ever needed. Um, it just it just took him down. So great to talk to Louis Shelton today. I mean, is it fair to say that uh, when you got to L.A., uh, I remember interviewing John Morrell, but uh, John's father was out there. So was, I mean, it was Tedesco, and it was Howard. Now, Ro- Lou, are you talking about Lou Morrell? Yeah, yeah. Well, I thought yeah. So Lou, yeah. John's father was a major because yeah. Tedesco got him out there. I was wondering if you, who were the cats? I mean, you were like, you were like in between, like you were right there uh, in that. I don't, I don't know if you were like original Wrecking Crew, but you were like right there, you know? It was like very cool. Well, you know, um, for the early part of the 60s, um, Bill Pittman was was an original. Right. Um, Bill Pittman, Tommy Tedesco. Uh, when, when, I, when I got there and uh, by the time I got there, the guys like Howard Roberts and Barney Kessel uh, were were included in, in that. Uh, they were mostly from the bebop era kind of players. Uh, I, I, I do remember Lou Morrell, and you know, he passed away very young. Um, uh, I think he was early 40s or something. Um, one of the main guys that, was the, uh, that, that I worked with almost on a, on a daily basis was Al Casey. Um, Al was, uh, was the number one rhythm guitar player. They usually booked us uh, most of the sessions had two guitar players, while a lead player and a rhythm player. And uh, Lou Morrell was a, a, mainly a rhythm player when I worked with him because most of the producers wanted me to play lead once once I had done uh, the lead on Last Train to Clarksville. They would, <laughs> they would come out and say, we want Louie to play the lead guitar, you know, and in case there was any question about <laughs> you know, because there was a bit of competition between 
uh, some of the lead players. I never had any problem with anyone. <laughs> I heard the story. Oh, uh, man. Can you uh, tell me? I mean, really, just, I mean, what, I, this is where the rubber meets the road. What was it? Can you just talk t- talk about a story that you heard? I mean, that to me is is righteously great. I mean, that, that like you never had a problem because nobody was going to touch you as it related to the solos. But I, I would assume. I mean, so like Casey, Casey was or or Lou, they they were totally comfortable in that role of rhythm, yeah. rhythm player, yeah. right? Yeah. Well, you know, it was um, yeah. Any of the older guys, they were comfortable with that. Um, uh, I'll mention one name, uh, Larry Carlton, who was a, a, a dear friend of mine. Whenever Larry and I played together, and we were both lead players, uh, we never had a problem because I, I, I wanted Larry to play lead, and he wanted me to play lead. Wow. And we wanted to wow. run stuff from each other. But uh, I heard later on that as newer lead players came in, uh, if they were on a session with Larry, they would right away, if when they counted the ten off, the other guy would start just playing a lot of stuff, you know. And I won't mention any names, but Larry told me, he said, it got to the point that where when someone called me for a session, I would say, um, uh, who's the other guitar player? And if it was someone who I won't mention, he would say, um, well, you don't need me if he's on the session because, you know, <laughs> he, he just didn't, he didn't like that kind of uh, thing. Dude, I, I, I mean, that's, that. I'm glad you brought, can you just talk about, um, Louis, you know, like, a lot of that is ego um, stuff. And yeah. you guys, like, sure. like, talking about Larry and... And Dean Parks and you, I mean, it was like you guys wanted to help each other. Is it fair to say that there was just so much work that nobody was really insecure about turf warfare territory? How did you learn to realize that the greatest gift that you had was giving it a, giving it all away? You know, like it, not hoarding it and not wanking it and not like talk like Larry's like that. Whoever the guy was, Larry's like, oh, I mean, he can, he's doing enough talking for both of us on the guitar. But that, you know, like, where, how did you learn to, I don't want to say manage your ego, but, you know, it just, it, it's, it's so hard, man, because as a, I'm 42, my generation and younger, they don't have, the, they're barely, I mean, is it just as simple to say that you guys were not insecure because you just could sing for your supper because there was so much work or was there something about your generation that really did cater to the fact that um, it was about serving the song and it wasn't that big a deal if someone else took the lead solo? Yeah, well, I think uh, for me, uh, I had this... uh this uh, train of thought that uh, I always, like you said, want, uh, was, want, was there to serve the song. I mean, if, if all that song needed was just a little bit of rhythm uh, or something, that's what I would play. Uh, if, if it needed a few R&B licks, I'd play those. Uh, or if they pointed and said, do a solo, I'd do that. But I, 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 I innately knew that if you go in there and try to show uh, everything that you know on the guitar and it doesn't work on the session, you won't get called back for the session. That's interesting. So, interesting. Uh, if I was in there with three other guitar players, we, we all had enough common sense to figure out, okay, if you're going to play that, I'm going to play something that's not going to get in the way of that. I'm going to find a different range on the guitar and I'm going to do something that works with that. Because uh, on all the Motown sessions, we always had three guitars for the most part uh, before Dean, Dean Parks came in it was it was me and David T Walker and Don Peak and uh, and we would just we would we just work out our own parts that complemented what the other guy was doing uh, we weren't jumping in and saying well, well let me play over the top of him so that that my step will really stand out you know 
uh, we we just made the pieces fit together because uh, there's no uh, I heard Alfred used to say you know leave your ego at the door man you know when, when you come in the studio it's all about do, doing the right thing for the record and um, sometimes that meant a little bit of playing and like uh, for example on last train to uh, last train to Cartsville uh, my guitar was the first thing you heard and, and the whole song basically was written around that riff which came to, came straight from me uh, and my wife and I were just talking about it recently uh, in this day and age I would have gotten writers for that because it contributed so much to the song but in, the, in that time uh, even though I was rewarded in other ways because it really got my foot in the door as a session player uh, I didn't get writer's credit for it. It's interesting that uh, I've never heard somebody... So so in, it's evolved now where if it's an integral part to the to the popularity of a tune, in today's world, you would have gotten credit as an instrumentalist. Well, my cousin who's a music attorney in, in L.A. said that even if the guy that programs the kick drum on a rap record gets part of the writer's because he... He, he does contracts for those guys. So yeah, it is it is a big part of the record. Uh, if, you, if you do something that's a integral part of the record, you get part of the writers now. I'm gonna read this. I, I did two interviews with David T. Walker. It just warms my heart that, that you and Peak and him were cooking the groove. And this is what he said, and then you can riff on it. He said, um, Let's see. Uh, by the early 70s, I was beginning to realize I had a sound, a flavor that was mine. I didn't realize when that happened. It's probably a good thing that I didn't. It was a natural thing. It just happened. I just wanted to be into the music, dedicated, and whatever happens, happens. Before I knew it, people were asking other people, hey, play that David T. style. Most of the time, except for the funk, it meant play sparsely, but compliment whatever is going on, especially with the singers. I learned how to do that because sometimes in the beginning there'd be three or four guitar players playing on the same track for commercial music. Everyone would just be bashing and everyone was loud. I started to find a place that I played these sixths and tenths, two notes at a time. I called it pretty stuff. Then I would go in and listen back and the engineer most of the time would have me up very loud. In the room you couldn't hear me because I didn't play very loud. I, I mean... Can you talk about, in your own way, like not, you know, when you were, it was just you and a rhythm player, but when it was like four, four players, or did you, did you, did you learn to find your own voice um, amongst other guitars? And also, is it fair to say, I think it, it is, but I mean, it was not the era of quote unquote guitar hero. So can you talk about the role of the guitar um, at that time in the in recording of music because at a certain point it became or it still seems now we're caught in this t uh, facility technique riffology sort of uh, paradigm um, and that wasn't even for a lead guitar player uh, that wasn't really necessarily what it was about when you were coming up well that style of guitar that David described uh, I, I could I could say that it first came from someone like Curtis Mayfield. Exactly. And some of those guys. Um, and of course, that was a style that I learned too from listening to all of the early R&B records and stuff. But the thing about that style uh, is it worked on so many different kinds of music and sessions. And and a lot of sessions that I, that I did uh, they would ask for that or, 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 or if they didn't ask for it and that's what I played they were happy with it it was just those simple little R&B licks in the right place um, and, 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 and because of, of the nature of, of that working so well that's what they would turn up in the mix and that's what you would hear on the record uh, if someone's out there trying to shred in the wrong place or something, you, you're not going to hear his track <laughs> on the, when, when the record comes out. So, I love uh, it. yeah, what David's describing is 
um, as just something that fits in in so many different kinds of, of records. And of course, uh, David really is identified with that sound, uh, but it's actually a sound that myself and Steve Cropper and all these other kids, Reggie Young, we all did that kind of stuff. Uh, and it was all simple and it always seemed, yeah, that's the right thing, that's the right lick and it's in the right place. And if you had, if you had the knack to be able to do that, you would get called for a lot of sessions. Uh, there were other guys who almost could only play rock and roll. Uh, when I say rock and roll, I mean, you know, a distorted guitar and stuff like that. Sure. Uh, you get them on a Ella Fitzgerald uh, session and they wouldn't, uh, they wouldn't know what to do. Uh, most of us were versatile. Uh, the guys like myself and, 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 and the newer players well, even, even the older guys, you know, like when I first started doing session, the guys that came from bebop, they really hadn't embraced rock and roll. They were, they were doing it for work because that was the only kind of work they could get. And they were actually uh, great guitar players uh, for the genre that they, they came from. Uh, uh, they would flat out tell you, I hate rock and roll. I'm not, not going to listen to Jimi Hendrix and, right. and all, this, all this crap. But then the new crop, which I think started with myself. It did. Dean said it started uh, with you, man. You were there before yeah, them. The, the thing that we all brought, uh, and which included uh, myself, Dean Parks, Larry Carlton, Lee Rittenauer, Steve Lukather, there was no kind of music you could put in front of us that we couldn't play and play uh, authentically, not like we're, we're faking uh, whatever it was. We could play R&B, we could play jazz, we, we, you know, whatever it was, country, uh, blues. Uh, we, 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 we had that versatility. And uh, you really couldn't say that about the older play players because first of all, they, they didn't put rock and roll strings on their guitar because you couldn't bend them, you know, you couldn't bend the notes and stuff, but uh, there was definitely uh, a change in, in, in that group of musicians that all of a sudden uh, was different than the previous years for the most part. Louis, I just want you to, for, for, for all the neophytes out there and, and for all the peeps that are, you know, going to hear this 50 years from now, can you talk about why the the beboppers were, um, I mean, like, why were they so, bebop is, I don't know how to say it, I mean, it's, you know, obviously a, a language unto itself, um, but why, can you just talk about, like, aside from the bending, so the bending of the strings, but as far as, like, were they just, like, snobs about it? Or that, like, it was not sophisticated enough? I, I, I think it's so interesting that, like, you know, you guys basically... Well, I mean, you were there. I mean... Well, well, before, well, I, before, I, I think I yeah. can explain Yeah, that. go ahead, please. It has to do with background. Uh, and I, I, you still there, Jake? Absolutely, yes. Okay. Uh, Myself, people like Glenn Campbell, who also became a, a very big session. Guitar Absolutely, player. yeah. Uh, we we spent we spent years in the clubs uh, playing the hits of the day, and uh, uh, whereas uh, the Barney Kessels and and people like that, they didn't they didn't I don't think they and they did that they. Uh, they were, you know, played with people like Peggy Lee and uh, whatever, those kind of artists. So, uh, so they, they want the, uh, they, they would not go home and listen to the Beatles, what George Harrison played on the record or what Eric Clapton played mm, uh, mm. in the early Cream records or Jeff Beck or any of that stuff. Whereas, um, most of us, uh, newer players we had all the jazz records and stuff or 
uh, you know, there was there was a time in my life where where I had a gig where I played jazz for the whole year. Oh. Uh, there were other times when I, a lot of times where I, I played a combination of the hits of the day, and then there would always be some jazz, there would be some blues, there was, you know, it, it was versatile. Um, and I don't think those guys had that kind of a versatile uh, background. Um, they were, they, they had sort of, uh, cut their little thing in uh, in the jazz world, and then and and then around that time in the '60s, you know, jazz took a real nosedive, and there was no work for jazz players. That's why on the Motown sessions, we ended up with Joe Sample and Wilton Felder from the Jazz Crusaders. They were regular players on the Motown sessions and a lot of the other sessions in town. Of course, then the jazz kind of had a bit of a comeback, and and Wilton was able to make his own records, and Joe Sample was w made some great uh, solo uh, albums later on. But there was a time when the only work they could get was uh, was jazz, what was uh, session work. A another thing, uh, the reason uh, those guys were called in the beginning is because. On the record dates, you had a contractor that called the musicians. You know, if 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 Bert Backrack wanted to make a record, he didn't call the musicians. There was a contractor uh, that that called the musicians. Well, this contractor, and I won't mention any names, but he would call someone like Joe Pat for a Motown record <laughs> because oh. I did. Joe Pass, Joe Pass has a, a great name. He knows that name. Right, right. But he doesn't know that, well, Joe Pass never listened to Motown. Joe's a, a jazz player. Total stone yeah. jazzer, yeah. Yeah, and uh, this was true with, with, with a lot. That's a, a reason why a lot of those guys were called is because the contractor knew their names. But, you know, it's like he didn't know my name because... I wasn't popular at anything, so uh, he couldn't distinguish the the difference between um, the kind of guitar player that actually should have been on the session and someone that was there. That uh, because I mean, uh, it's you you a lot of these guys uh, they mainly ended up playing rhythm, you know, because they never played anything that would any kind of solo licks and stuff that would be would be heard on a hit record, you know? Totally. No, what about, I wanted to ask you, do you, were they, was part of it, of their sort of dis-ease with the new music also just the, um, the, 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 the amplification, like sonically, it was much louder than than playing jazz you know i mean in some cases a lot of those jazzers uh they played clubs but they maybe the bass wasn't even amped uh you know a lot of times they're that's why they had huge ears you know they i just wonder what that you know you talk about clapton or you know the, the, the hendrix i mean that was just like it, sonically like way off the charts compared to obviously by the mid 60s jazz had taken a nosedive but do you think part of it was just like just the, the 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 sheer sonic expansion of the music. Well, um, m most of those guys uh, were were it was a band situation, and and uh, the 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 stuff they did in the studio is what they did live in the clubs, which was loud. Yeah. And so the studio just had to deal with that, um, whereas. Uh, at, at, at the uh, session level uh, uh, in LA or, or New York uh, where it's not a big rock and roll band a lot of times you had so many open mics because we were all in the same room uh, in the early days we didn't have a lot of separate rooms where you could isolate the guitars from the drums and of course you know drums may, they might have 12 open mics on them and also a lot of times you're in the same room where they're doing the strings and the piano. So we weren't allowed to crank our amps really loud. Uh, so if we wanted to get a little bit of dirt in our 
uh, amplifier sound. Where that's what, how the master uh, volume uh, knob came on the amplifier. We could crank the preamp, but turn the overall volume down so that we got a little bit of uh, a dirty sound. Oh, on the interesting, volume. interesting. But yeah. uh, getting back to the uh, the difference between why the older guys from the older generation uh, were different from uh, from someone like myself is they literally found the music boring because compared to what they, they, they were used to playing, commercial music is so simple. You know, it's three chords. Sure, and, um, sure, sure. Uh, by comparison to, to the jazz stuff that these guys, uh, you know, it's, there's just a huge difference. So for someone like a, 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 a Barney Kessel or someone like that, the pop music was just boring to them, <laughs> and and after doing it for a couple of years, you know, they just they were gritting their teeth and let's get this over with, and you know what I mean. Whereas someone like myself, we at home we listen to these records and and we want to make records like what we're listening to, you know. Uh, if, if 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 George Harrison inspired an idea. You know, that's fine. I would do a George Harrison thing. But I like on my solo on Hello with Lionel Richie, um, I had to give credit to, you know, to my listening to Wes Montgomery and, and all the other great guitar players that I, I listened to and learned from uh, that became part of my arsenal as a player. Uh, where I used the octaves in that solo that, you know, I learned that from Wes Montgomery and I made it work in a commercial uh, setting. Um, so... I, I want to... The, 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 you know, it just warms my heart. Uh, he, he was not a dear friend, but uh, I had a chance to do an interview with him and I just always thought he was one of the nastiest... Uh, bass players around uh, and I feel like you probably maybe toured with him and definitely worked in the studios with him was Larry Taylor yeah he one of my you know, one, one of my favorite because I know he was with the monkeys a lot played a lot with the monkeys and uh, anyway the floor is yours I just talk that guy was freaking him and Paul Lagos like those guys were freaking crazy man well it's interesting that uh that, that first group of musicians that, that cut the monkeys hits, the major hits, Last Train to Clarksville, Hey Hey Were the Monkeys, uh, Not Your Stepping Stone. Uh, that was a bunch of us totally unknown musicians. Myself, <laughs> I wasn't known at the time. Right. Uh, Larry Taylor, uh, no one ever, had ever heard of him. And uh, Bill Lewis, who played drums on all that stuff, he's passed away wow. uh, years ago. Um, no, no one really ever knew who played that, uh, played on those records. And um, uh, actually, the some of the Wrecking Crew guys sort of take credit for that, but it was totally unknown players. Um, but uh, that was the first thing that I. That, and the only thing that I ever did with Larry, but I did t tour with him and uh, on, on, on a, a, a bit of a voice and heart tour, we played on their records as well. That's when I I, 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 I got this voice and voice and heart uh, record, and uh, and you're on there with Larry Taylor. It's like on MGM or, or it's on like Verve or something. Well, originally I think they were on A and M. Um, right. I believe. Uh, well, see, Larry was was in Bob Lee Hart's band, uh, and all and, and those other musicians, uh, Jerry McGee and Larry Taylor, and uh, probably Bill Lewis. They were in Bobby Hart's band, and for the monkey stuff, they just added me, because I had done Voice and Hearts demos when they were writers for Screen Gems, but after that bit of touring uh, with Larry. Uh, of course, then he went off and and, and did that uh, can heat, the can heat thing, and went to 
you know, did that big uh, uh, thing in New York. In Woodstock, well, yeah. Yeah, I never saw Larry again. <laughs> then, Dude, um, Larry Taylor, man, rest in peace. Dude, I love that you two were playing Boyce and Hart, and uh, it's just so – first of all, Louie, can you talk about – I mean, I've never seen this album before – you had a chance to be a leader in 1969. How did that come about? Uh, which album was that? Touch Me, uh, Touch Me. Oh, yeah. Uh, well, Boyce and Hart, uh, they were so impressed with my playing that they got me a record deal with Warner Brothers and produced that album. That's how that happened. Uh, I mean, you were maybe too, almost like the... The, 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 the bright light I mean I'm looking here Son of a Preacher Man Med, uh, Walking the, a lot of covers but I mean did you have a yeah. lot I mean was it did you looking in hindsight does it seem like a dream or were you kind of able to pinch yourself at that moment and be like I cannot be, I mean that's amazing that you cut your first album in 69 <laughs> yeah <laughs> yeah it, it's interesting um uh, shortly after that I was so busy doing session work and I had no faith in a solo career as far as a recording artist so I didn't even think about doing a second album <laughs> and uh, it wasn't uh, you know until 30 years later that I started thinking Christ I should have 30 albums out by now and I only did one it's alright um, I do I cannot wait to get this album dude I mean, I've never seen it in my life. It's yeah. unbelievable. It's on. Un do you? Do, did you? Uh, I just want you to talk also to younger cats. Um, Botnik and I were breaking this down, but I, you were talking before about your preamp versus, you know, like um, having to keep your levels low because everybody, you know, the, the the magic of the of that time, in so many ways, was that you were hitting live. Like, everybody was hitting live at the same time. There wasn't this insane amount of uh, meticulous spending four weeks mastering something. It was, you had to get it done. Oh, that's a good take. Let's move on to the next one. Like, you all were in the same studio hitting at the same time, and there wasn't a preoccupation with perfection. Obviously, if somebody clammed a note or something, maybe that would even stay on the... I mean, did you did you play on... Some hit tune, like David Spinoza talked about um, Right Place, Wrong Time. That was a, a Dr. John tune. And he was in Atlantic with Arif Mardin, and they pulled him into the studio. He was on his way to a jingle date, and uh, they wanted him to lay a solo on, on that. And uh, he tuned up, <clears throat> plugged in, and then played his solo when he hit this clam. And he's like, okay, I, I, let me do it again. They're like, no, that's perfect. And it came wow. that 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 became a hit, and I'm just like, yeah. did, did, you know, Dean had some of those. Did you have a situation where you were like, where like one of those clams actually made it onto a a, a pop a hit a hit tune? Uh, thankfully, no. <laughs> Not that I can recall, but no, that whole um, you know, I have to realize uh the, the, the way the recording scene was in L.A. at that time, literally, is uh, we were doing three and four sessions a day. Uh, so I might be at A&M for a 10 to 1 session and a 2 to 5 over at the Sound Factory and a 7 to 10 at another studio. And, and then uh, as I was leaving one studio, another band would be coming in to for another session, which was a nightmare for the engineer because he had to all of a sudden set up a different drummer's kit and, and get all this stuff going so that they could count a tune off within the first half hour of the session. And um, <laughs> so our, our routine team was, was basically, we're expected to do three songs, three masters in three hours. And so, that process usually involved the engineer getting a sound on your guitar, the drums, the keyboards, doing all that. Then they lay a chart in front of you, which for us guitar players was usually just a chord chart or a roadmap. And then they count 
Uh, sometimes they would play us a demo that someone had done of the song, and we'd kind of follow the chart. But our, our normal routine was we'd run the tune down once, maybe get halfway through it and stop and make some changes, and run it through again. And then by the third time, the red light was on, and we were playing the tune. Wow. That's the wow. way it, that's the way it went. I mean, that was just a, a regular occurrence with with the recording session uh, whereas today you know you uh, yeah pe- you know people take months to do months a, a it's record, just in the you know? by the time it's i hate to say it but they suck all the soul out of it to me you guys yeah. like your heart you, you know you had to be under a little bit of i don't want to say pressure but there was a time pressure component and you knew you wanted to you know you wanted to keep getting called back so you wanted to play well and there was no yeah. time for being like overly um, just obsessed about getting everything so perfectly right. And yet it's still, it, the music came out. I mean, like, let's get it on with Marvin Gaye. Like, can you, yeah. th- that, that's the thing that working, if you ever worked with um, Gene Page, he would come in, uh, uh, David T told me, <clears throat> you know, he would just give, them a chord a, a chord chart it was not yeah. it was a road map and then he allowed you guys to to do what you did and do what you did yeah. that and that that's just that's the best way to have a team is when you bring people on to do what they do and there's no micromanaging can you can you just talk about that in hindsight and how um liberating it must have been to not just be getting uh you know seeing your you know seeing your life you know being able to move up in your life economically, but also being able to to have a lot of creative freedom? Yeah. Well, you have to realize that um, every musician in that room uh, has, has a very high degree of uh, confidence and uh, perfection and in, in, in what he's doing. Um, uh, very few mistakes were made, and 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 everyone's giving it a hundred percent. And you don't want to be the guy that uh, that says, "Oh, I made a clam at bar thirty-five. Can we re- redo the tape?" Right, you know? right. So you don't want to let anybody uh, down. You, yeah. you you become good at what you do uh, with 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 such experience and having come came there with uh, having. Ha- you're not, you're not worrying about your technique and stuff like that, you know, you're confident and you're playing because you feel like there's no one in that room that's worked harder at what you do than you have. And uh, I, I knew that no one had ever listened to more music than I did <laughs> and uh, I, or, or that, that had a clue about what would work. Uh, I mean, yeah, I was open for suggestions, but, but uh, I just... Uh, you know, you just sort of, you really uh, had your finger on the pulse of what was going on, and 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 everybody worked together. Like I say, giving it a hundred percent, and uh, and with confidence. So, uh, yeah, it, it's just something you got used to. You know, it didn't matter whether you were you were in there recording a bubble gum commercial or you were doing a TV show with with fifty musicians. You know. Uh, you you just felt comfortable in in, in, in those shoes, you know. Uh, Louis, we're gonna have to do set two, man. I mean, like you've been blowing my mind right now. I, I freaking love. <laughs> I just wonder about, um, you know, after you worked in the studios all day. <clears throat> I mean, when you got out to L.A., were you playing? I mean, were you hip to like Larry Gale's Coffee House? Did you did you play jet? Did you go play just to get stuff off your chest? I mean, a lot of the guys you probably could go out and play at night if you got out. I mean, if you got off the session at enough time, you go out and play for free because you were making dough during the day. I did you? Yeah. Did you? Um, did you play with the with? The, there was a, just an incredible. Again, jazz has always been a, a subculture, pretty much. You know, uh, but. I just wonder about uh, when you got out there. Um, you know, were, were there were there clubs that you would go to after a full day in the studios just to be able to play some jazz? 
Well, there are definitely some great clubs there. You know, Shelly's Man, Shelly Man had Shelly's Yeah, did Man you play at Shelly's? No, I, I didn't, but I would go see other other great uh, uh when I first got out there, I was totally unknown, but I got most of the club playing out of my system before I got, because I, I didn't get to do sessions right away. I had to work in the clubs for a few years before I, I got into the session scene. Uh, but in those early days, uh, there were some great jazz clubs that I was able to go and hear great artists. Um, and then, uh, but there were other guys uh, new clubs uh, you know Dante's opened up out there in the valley and guys like uh, uh, Larry Carlton would go play there and Jeff DeCaro or Greg Matheson uh, but by that time I was producing and I didn't really have time to, to hit the clubs you know uh, very often no but so, I want to be clear th- th- this is so important you're telling me that when you first you, you, you played the roadhouses in Arkansas or when you got to LA you played clubs out there too. Maybe not. Oh, I played clubs out in LA too. No, so which yeah. club? I mean, but it wasn't necessarily jazz. It, but I mean, what cl- were you were you playing the Lighthouse? I mean, what, what where were you playing? No, uh, we were playing the Prelude in North and over in the Valley. I believe it was on Lancashire. The Prelude. Wow, that's this is uh, all new territory. So like that was like, I mean, who was in that band? <laughs> who was well, that? that was that was me and Sills and Crofts and uh, my oh. brother-in-law. Uh, Joe Bogan, who who later became a top engineer, who who engineered Al Jarreau and the Manhattan Transfer and Dolly Parton and who knows who all. Uh, my brother-in-law, Joe Bogan. Uh, wow. Yeah. Wow. He, he had, yeah. So it was Sills and Crofts uh, and myself and and Joe Bogan, and we we had a four-piece um, and. Uh, that was before they became seals and crawl. I cannot believe. Wait, you're playing. You were. Pre, you were. Dude, that. What were they playing? What were the instruments were they playing? Uh, Cross was playing drums and seals was playing sax. Because, dude, you know, where were, I do you have any? I need to, that. Must have been the smoking most smoking band ever, dude. Oh yeah, I do have uh, a recording of that 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 uh, uh, a a friend recorded. Uh, in one of the clubs there. It's oh unbelievable. My. Dude, dude, Louie, yeah. that is, Louie, that is the most, I cannot believe you were, did you, how did you, I guess, maybe we'll wrap set one with, how did you meet those cats? Oh, uh, you know, well, they were with the champs for all those years, uh, Seals and Crofts, right. drummer and sax player with the champs. So when the champs uh, split up, uh, Jimmy and Dash, uh, formed a four-piece band that play in the clubs in L.A., and uh, their original guitar player uh, quit, and and that's how someone uh, told them about me. And uh, so I was playing the clubs at that time, and uh, one of them came into the club where I was working, and that's how I first met up with them. And... Uh, uh, as far as the band, actually, I had met Jimmy and Dash when they came through Santa Fe. I was working in a club in Santa Fe. Wow! And, and they came through with the Champs, uh, and they, uh, Glenn Campbell, was in the band at the time. And of course, I knew Glenn from before he went out to California, because we were both working in Albuquerque together for for a long time. But <clears throat> but I had breakfast with Jimmy and Dash in, in Santa Fe. And then later became a band member with them out in L.A. when they uh, formed this four-piece band, and uh, and I was with them up until the time that uh, I, I quit uh, because I had done the last train to Clarksville and and was starting to get all the studio work, and so the band kind of quit, and then they uh, Crofts grabbed a mandolin and started learned how to play that, and Jimmy. Seals started writing all of these great songs, and they became Seals and Crofts. And uh, yeah, that's the way all that happened. Wait, I I just want to be clear: the, the the quartet you were in with your brother-in-law and those cats—that was an instrumental band. Uh, no, we did vocals. We did vocals too. You did vocals was, too. So I mean, it, yeah. It was one of those situations where it was a cover band, 
and we were playing in clubs that, uh, you know, were, were typical dance nightclubs. Louis, but, Louis, we, I, dude, we got it. I got to hear that tape, man. That is vintage, man. That is yeah. so unbelievable. Do you think, looking back, I mean, because I was thinking, there, there. I mean, you can't get better harmonies and 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 voices than Seals and Crofts. I mean, I mean, do you yeah. do, do you feel like that experience really actually was incredibly beneficial for you to serve songs once you started to get studio work? Oh yeah. Not that um, not that you weren't immersed in music before that. It's just. I couldn't th- if those guys were singing. Um, it's just bl- mind blowing because you're on all their studio. Obviously, when they started to cut s- albums as a, as Seals and Crofts, you were on every one of them. But um, I mean, they're voting. Well, yeah. During that club stuff, uh, the, 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 they were singing mostly soul soul music and and and, and blues. Sure. And, uh, they were both great singers uh, there were no stinky notes with them at all man they sang in key uh, they had all the stuff so when they put that together and and created their own style that became seals and crops uh, they had this this great uh, ability to sing uh, uh, perfectly and in, in tune and in harmony uh, that that if you heard them live, you would think they were auto-tuned. You know, they never sang a bad note in their life. Unbelievable. That is so freaking amazing, dude. I mean, that is. You just went. You went to Never Everland on me right there. I mean, that is unbelievable. I, you, um, you, you had made connections. The the there's a couple of. To me, you were sort of a the go-to cat as it relates to the master blues players, um, T-Bone Walker. Did you know those guys before? You just, I mean, because you're on a couple of those albums that you know some of the '70s stuff that he was on. Um, yeah. I mean, you were because you weren't. Let's put it this way: you were more R&B, blues, soul cat. Is that right? Yeah. Yeah, um, well, yeah, and everything in between. <laughs> but it was uh, the producers of those records that called me because I hadn't had any previous connection with T Bone Walker. Or, uh, I did some stuff with Otis Spann and some of the other I saw that, yeah, I saw that. Guys. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, so it was the producers that, uh, that, that put, you know, they called me because they were familiar with my work. Yeah. So, um, you know, here's, yeah. here's an interesting story. Dude, just go. Uh, on the uh, T-Bone Walker session, uh, on, the last, on the last day, we had 15 minutes left for the session. And uh, the producer says, well, uh, we got 50, we've got time to cut more one tunes. Uh, one more tune. Does anyone have a tune? And uh, I raised my hand and said, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and I basically counted the tune off in B flat, and we played an instrumental, and it went on T Bone's record, and I got writer's credit for it. What's the What's the name of the tune? We called it Blues for BB. <laughs> if I remember correctly, I think like I could have been. I think Dizzy Gillespie was on that album. I could be wrong about that. I, there were some. That is so classic, dude. You got you, yeah. so that that's that's one of the few tracks you got writer's credit for that's that's really yeah i was i was just a, a side musician on the album but, uh, well l- listen l- let's you know after the new year let's you can we do set two sure it, this, yeah. it's great it's so good to connect with you man and uh um i appreciate you dropping the knowledge and uh i'm also curious as to why you, you're living in australia these days uh-huh well I, I guess if you were here, you would understand. <laughs> yeah, no, we'll get it's into sort it. Of yeah. the best place to be right now, I'll tell you. We have no uh, COVID here uh, up in, in my state of Queensland. How is that um, possible? 
Well, they closed the borders on this state when they when it first started, and uh, and uh, if you came in, uh, you had to to go into two weeks of lockdown in a hotel. Interesting. Um, Interesting. So, and then they and then anybody who might have they just contact traced all the people, right? Yeah. Yeah. Well, uh, I mean, Louis, yeah. man, be safe, man. Um, bless you, brother. It was this was. I'm glad because yeah, we are just getting eviscerated here by it yeah i know i have so much family over there in nashville and la and uh, nashville's sort of a hot spot of the world right now so uh, i know my son-in-law just got his uh, vaccination yesterday so hopefully uh the vaccine will 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 take hold pretty soon and start helping uh get this thing under control because we're not able to go over there at this time we were supposed to have been over there three months ago. Oh, I bet. I bet. And, I mean, my, I, I haven't, I haven't, my parents haven't been able to see their grandkids. I haven't seen my parents all year. It's it's insane, man. It's, it's, yeah. it, it is as bad as you think it is. It's, mm-hmm. and for some people, it's beyond that. I mean, and so I just continue to stay humble. I feel thankful to still uh, yeah. be able to get behind the microphone and, and talk to cats like you. And I, and I know yeah. that, that, uh, that um yeah they'll hopefully we'll turn the corner it'll be a safer time but not right now no it's going to take a while so we just have to be patient and be safe yeah we'll do like another we'll do like another six interviews you know before that you know uh, okay <laughs> all right much love to you louie thank to you and uh and thank you for having me absolutely brother peace and uh much love into the new year we'll be in touch all right buddy thank you cheers man Bye-bye. bye Three interviews in the books. That's it for the Jake Feinberg Show. We'll be back next week. Be safe.